Good morning everybody, happy Easter. Uh, welcome to Crofton Park Baptist Church. My name is Clement Oke and um, I'd like to say it's great to see you, but uh, I can't see you physically, but I know you're out there. So we're going to start uh, Easter Sunday service in a few seconds time, under a minute. And Steve's going to come along and give you the message. So um, I pray this morning that this service will be uninterrupted. The uh, gremlins won't get in the way of our technology and you'll all be able to share and be ministered to uh, by this word. Um, also, if you are on Facebook and you're not watching through the website, you can start a watch party with your friends. Uh, there should be a little link there at the bottom somewhere where you can just start a watch party, let your friends know that you are watching our live stream, and then they can join in too. So, uh, God bless you as you hear this message this morning. Yes, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Pastor Steve Ewing uh, from Crofton Park Baptist Church and may I also wish you a very happy Easter. Everything seems normal. Um, it's a beautiful morning, it's Easter morning, it's warm, the sun is shining, I'm in church. Um, except it's rather strange because on Easter Sunday it says no one is here. Um, and yet at the same time, I'm reminded of the fact that the church is not a building, it's the people of God, and even if we are gathered in a rather different way, we're here to celebrate this most joyous of Christian uh, festivals. We read, When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead. Let's rejoice as we pray. Please pray with me as I lead. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Loving God, we worship you today with joy in our hearts and thanksgiving on our lips. When the powers of evil had done their worst, crucifying your son and burying him in death, you raised him to life again, an act of power, giving hope to the world. Lord Jesus, we rejoice that death could not keep you in its grip, that you were raised to life, alive forevermore. You greeted your friends and now Stand with your people in your risen power. Spirit of God, you are always giving life to the people of God, giving birth to children of God. Remodel us in the image of Jesus. Fill us with his love and enable us with his risen power so we might be faithful to his way, used by you in redeeming your world. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And now two readings from the Bible, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. To begin with, from the Old Testament, from the 118th Psalm, reading the second half of the Psalm from verse 14 through to verse 29. This is what the Psalmist says. 
The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not let me die. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it's wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please Lord, please save us. Please Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, his faithful love endures forever. And then in the New Testament, reading one of the Gospel accounts of the events of that first Easter Sunday morning, Luke chapter 24 and the first 12 verses. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hand of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalena, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. The day, everything changed. So Jesus has been crucified. Well, that's it then. That's what his followers must have been thinking. They simply did not expect the resurrection of Jesus. We read that when the two Marys, Joanna and several other women, tried to tell the men what happened at the tomb, that they did not believe the women because their words sounded like nonsense. Did you 
just weren't expecting anything like this. It seemed to all intents and purposes as though any impact Jesus had made would soon disappear. They're in the grip of feelings of grief and pain, guilt and failure, feelings that have only just begun to hit them. If the disciples slept at all on that Friday night that Jesus was crucified, and they may, may well have done so from the sheer exhaustion of the previous night and day, if they slept, then I expect that when they woke on Saturday morning, they would find that the city that was screaming for blood the day before was now in quiet Sabbath observation. Crowds have disbanded. Jesus is dead. And that was the stark reality the disciples, if they slept, woke up to. Jesus had failed. He simply didn't get enough followers, couldn't convince the chief priests, couldn't get enough ordinary people to understand his message. And now, there's nothing. Just this hollow feeling of despair and fear in the pit of the stomach. That Saturday was bleak and hopeless. With the lockdown caused by the coronavirus pandemic, it may feel as if in some ways we've entered a kind of wilderness of sorts, a vast desert, an unknown land with few signposts to guide us or the governments as they implement lockdowns and scramble to keep people safe and their income steady. In a way, it's a bit like the wilderness where Jesus faced temptations and the wilderness the Israelites lived in before reaching their promised land. In this wilderness, we mourn with friends and neighbours the loss of their loved ones, the loss of their jobs, and are perhaps aware that much pain happens behind the closed doors of many homes. Especially during this wilderness time, we may want to see people around us enter into God's kingdom and be set free for eternity. We yearn for the promised land, but in the meantime, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the wilderness, it's the Saturday experience. On Friday night, Jesus had been crucified and placed in a tomb with a heavy stone and a guard outside. So when some women, followers of Jesus, come early on Sunday morning to put spices on his dead body to prepare it for burial, you'd expect Jesus to be where he had been on Friday night, wouldn't you? They were certainly not expecting an empty tomb. They go to the tomb and they do not find Jesus. Instead, they meet an angel who gives them the best news in the world. And it meant Sunday was the day everything changed. Why look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. In Psalm 118 that I read a few minutes ago, the psalmist has clearly been through a difficult time. He writes in verse 18, as the message puts it, God tested me, he pushed me hard. Yet he's full of thanksgiving, praise and rejoicing. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord. He says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He's full of thanksgiving because he sees that God is able to bring success 
out of apparent defeat. And he writes, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the supreme example of God bringing success out of apparent failure. He's the stone the builders rejected, which has now become the cornerstone of the church. And Jesus quotes this verse in Psalm 118 as referring to himself. Later, his follower Peter also makes this application, pointing out that Jesus is the living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen by God. Jesus is now the chief cornerstone on which the whole church rests. So on Saturday, the eternal Son of God lies dead. But Jesus defeats our greatest enemy, not by, by proclaiming his invincibility over it, by succumbing to it, by submitting himself to it. A man called Father Raniero Cantalamessa, Franciscan monk and preacher to the papal household, was about to be involved in a public debate with one of the so-called new atheists in Italy. And he was asked whether he thought he would win the debate. He replied that he did not know he might lose. But he added, the Lord can be glorified in defeat. That's what Jesus did. He reversed the values of the world. He turned the world upside down. Four weeks ago, the last time that we gathered together as a church at Crofton Park, Linda Sabana was leading an all-age service. And she caused us to make all these crosses together and asked me, um, I was sitting at the back over there, um, whether it would be okay to display these on Easter Sunday. Well, no one's here on Easter Sunday. But I brought one of these crosses with me that Linda gave us to, to have. Because it reminds us that it was supremely on the cross that Jesus turned the world upside down. In an act of ultimate humiliation and apparent defeat, he brought the greatest victory the world has ever known. So if we're looking for Jesus, we won't find him in a grave. Every other person from history has ended up dead and stayed dead. But Jesus passed all the way through death and came out the other side. He's the only person who's ever done it. Imagine if Jesus had died and stayed dead in that tomb. Maybe the women would have come, paid their respects to the memory of Jesus, remembered his teaching and his love and the example that he set, and then gone home and got on with their lives without him. It would be an honourable thing to do. And perhaps they'd come back again next year on the anniversary of his death and pay their respects again. That would make total sense, wouldn't it? if Jesus had stayed dead. But if he rose from the dead, once these women heard about it, they couldn't dream of carrying on as normal. Once they hear he's alive, they can't go back to their old lives. Once the angel tells them they need to meet this risen Jesus. What if Jesus really is risen. Well, it transforms everything. You see, without the fact of the resurrection, the church would never have been born. 
And without the ongoing reality of the resurrection, the church would never have survived. There's not much point in praying to a corpse. That's why we can't simply place Jesus alongside other great moral guides and religious teachers. They're dead. After Jesus rose from the dead, his followers soon began to become regarded as, and it says this in the book of Acts, the people who were causing trouble all over the world or turning the world upside down. Because Jesus has risen, we can know his presence. It transforms everything. If the greatest enemy has been defeated, it changes everything. Because this is about new life. Easter, we think about new life. We have Easter eggs that speak of new life. We see the signs of spring everywhere. But for Christians, that's just a symbol of the most important new life of all. Because being a Christian is not about trying to follow a code of practice or trying to imitate the lifestyle of a first century Palestinian preacher. It's about knowing Jesus as a person, someone who's alive today, will be alive tomorrow and forevermore. So John, who was an eyewitness to Jesus rising from the dead, says in his gospel why he wrote about Jesus. And he says that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Unlike any other religion or faith system, Christianity traces its origin to one particular event, at one particular moment, on one particular day in history. Easter Sunday is the day that gave birth to the most death-defying, grave-defeating, fear-destroying, hope-inspiring, transcendent joy in the history of the world. Supremely, what was released on that first Easter Sunday morning was hope. Certainly not hope that everything would be fine from now on. Those early followers of Jesus would very soon realise that that was far from true. Yes, it's true it would be life after death. But most importantly, this was hope that called people to die. Die to selfishness, to greed, to fear. In other words, die to a lesser self so a greater self would be born. They see those followers of Jesus knew they were in great danger. And yet they could not contain this feeling that despite that, somehow, everything had changed. They started meeting on the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, and called it the Lord's Day, because he rose again. And they began to understand themselves to be a kind of resurrection community. God, who had created life, was recreating it. And yet Easter 2020 is a strange time. For church buildings to be closed during this central festival to our faith is to use that rather overused word, an unprecedented event in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. But we should remember that the risen Christ appeared to his disciples in a lockdown situation. Yes, he was alive, but the authorities were not exactly pleased to hear the news. They were behind closed doors. They were in fear for their lives. And then Jesus appeared and declared, peace 
be with you. We may be spending Easter in a kind of isolation, but we should remember that his presence, the presence of Jesus, knows no physical boundaries and can overcome any lockdown. One of the novels of the great novelist Charles Dickens, published in 1859, is called A Tale of Two Cities. It's set in London and Paris before the French Revolution. And these are the opening words of the novel. It says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times best of times, the worst of times. And in a way this can be a parallel to the situation the church is in right now. In the book of Jeremiah the prophet writes these words, blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. In Crofton Park Baptist Church lately, we've been doing some uh, teaching, a series um, called Purpose Driven Church or Purpose Driven Life by a man called Rick Warren. And Rick Warren has said this, one of the things that I believe is that bad times are good times for the church. The good news gets better as society gets darker because our light just shines brighter. And he refers to the 1930s, the time of the Great Depression, where he says there were two things that increased theatre attendance and church attendance. Well, clearly church attendance is not going to increase right now in this crisis. But maybe this will be a time when people do begin to think more about God and even turn to him. God turns things upside down. The psalmist speaks of when the heat comes, sorry, Jeremiah rather, speaks of when the heat comes. And when the heat comes, we would expect the leaves of the tree to dry out, maybe to turn brown. But because the tree is planted by water, it sends out roots by the stream and the leaves are always green. like the person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, because that person will not fear when heat comes. There are times in your life when the heat increases. Now might be such a time. You may be tested by difficult circumstances and challenges. But if you stay close to the Lord, trusting in him, God is able to turn things upside down. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Trusting is different from the usual command to love and obey the Lord. You can love and obey someone without trusting them. Trusting speaks of letting go, allowing God to guide, not holding back. It's a child in a parent's arms, never doubting for a moment that they're safe. That's trust. When her brother died, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Do you believe this? He says. And maybe that's what we need to ask ourselves now about Jesus and his resurrection. At this time, 
in 2020, during this pandemic, during lockdown? Do you believe this? Because things may seem bleak in many ways. We may seem to be going through a long lasting wilderness experience. No one knows how long. But if Jesus really did rise back to life again, then it changes everything. Jesus risen presence always changes everything. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory thou or death has won. The day that changed everything. May we rejoice and be glad this Easter Sunday. Would you join me as I pray? Lord God Almighty, Heavenly Father, thank you that we can trust you and have confidence in you, even when the circumstances seem to be against us. Thank you that you turn a year of drought into a year of bearing fruit. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, who brought victory out of seeming defeat. Help us to proclaim Jesus whatever our circumstances and to put our trust and confidence in him, however difficult things may seem. And Father, when we are despairing, when the world is full of grief, when we see no way ahead and it seems hope has gone away, roll back the stone. Because we're coming with the women. Because we hope where hope is vain. Because you call us from the grave and show us the way. Roll back the stone. For on Easter day, we find that Jesus, who was dead, is alive again. And we see his promise that those who put their trust in him will not be swept away by death, but shall have eternal life. On this day of light and gladness, Help us to put darkness out of our lives. Make us willing and able to change our ways of thinking and speaking and doing into Easter ways. So that how we behave and what we believe, may, it may bear out what we believe. And so that Christ's new creation may become in us not just a hope, but a fact, a reality. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that death could not hold you. The, the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Now and forever, God, you reign. Jesus Christ, our Lord, risen from the dead, alive forevermore.
It's been good to be with you this Easter Sunday. Clement's going to come now and take us through a few different items and we'll finish our service this morning. I hope that you have a really joyful, peaceful, hope-filled and happy Easter. Um, happy Easter, everyone. Um, there are a couple of things I'm going to go through, some notices, um, our mission prayer, because we normally have a slot for the mission prayer uh, every Sunday. And we'll be praying for Joe Sharples, who incidentally is actually on the live feed at the moment. Um, just to let you know, she has sent a message, which I will play. Um, but what I'll do is I'm going to go through some of the items I can go through now on camera. And then I may have to interrupt the live feed so I can set up the message so you can um, stay tuned for after a couple of minutes. I'll restart the live feed and then you can watch uh, Joe's message and also a two minute uh, reflection uh, video that we have also had lined up. So Jo Sharples um, might be telling you online at the moment what she does, but she is, she's based in South Africa. Uh, she's a missionary in South Africa that we support. Um, she's working with um, a church there and an outreach where they uh, work against human trafficking, which is one of the things that's a scourge, a scourge in our uh, world at the moment. A lot of things that um, would be in focus if it weren't for the pandemic are no longer, but that work is still very, very important. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer for Joe now. Father Lord, thank you for, uh, for Joe. We thank you for the work that she does with the vulnerable in South Africa. We pray, Lord, that you continue to give her the strength the resolve, and also, Lord, the um, divine direction from you as to how she can continue, Lord, to fight this um, human trafficking, which is one of the worst things, Lord, that can happen, one of the worst things that can happen to people in this world, Lord. It's a very, very serious um, problem, one that gets overlooked because it's usually very hidden. Um, and it comes in all sorts of guises, such as helping people have a better life or enticing them to places where they think things are going to be better for them. I pray, Lord, that you continue to bless her, continue to strengthen her, continue to um, bless her work, bless the work of her hands, so that those who are affected by um, this, Lord, will be freed, just as you freed us on this day over 2,000 years ago. Pray, Lord, that through the work she does, those that she helps will also continue to pay it forward to spread the word about the evils of human trafficking and all the other work that she does there, Lord, and so that that work will be multiplied and the benefits, Lord, will be felt throughout. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi there, Crofton Park Baptist Church. Just a quick message from Joe. First of all, happy Easter to you. Um, We'll also be doing the online services. Sorry that uh, we can't meet in person. I do enjoy the Easter services, uh, particularly we normally have a sunrise service. Just to say I'm doing fine and thank you for your concern and your messages and prayers as usual. And um, yeah, we're all in lockdown. Lockdown here in South Africa means no, uh, no going out, no going for walks like you guys. At the moment, we're early in our uh, stage of stopping the spread. Only about 16 have died at the moment and uh, about one and a half thousand are positive, tested positive so far. So we're at the tip of the iceberg. So just pray that the, the virus doesn't really spread into our townships because it could be really quite traumatic and our figures could be very high. So yeah, happy Easter. Nice to hear from you all. God bless. <laughs> 